Okay, very good. So um, we're going to uh, talk about something called, uh, let's see, so uh, we're chapter three, section two, and this is called uh, the uh, tidal forces. And um, let's see, uh, the setup uh, that we're thinking about is the following. So we have a Lorentzian manifold. And uh, well, what does this mean? Well, this means that this is a manifold. And this is a Lorentzian metric, right? So Lorentzian metric. And um, yes, yeah, so Lorentzian metric is uh, uh, something which uh, uh, looks like a Minkowski metric in local inertial coordinate, right? So this means that uh, at every point of the manifold, uh, one can find coordinates. Uh, so that uh, this metric uh, G uh, takes the form minus dt square at P uh, plus dx1 square and, and so forth. Uh, of course, for physics, you're going to take uh, n equal 3, so 3 plus 1 dimensions. Uh, if you do old-fashioned physics uh, of the kind I'm thinking about here, uh, of course, if you do string theory or, or something else, so this n can be very large. It can be 10 or maybe any other favorite number that you like. Uh, and uh, you can convince people that um, uh, this is a good dimension to do your quantum theory. So, so this is Lorentzian manifold, Lorentzian metric, and uh, so this, these are local inertial coordinates, right? So local uh, inertial coordinates. And I'm going to write uh, L, LIC for this uh, in what follows. And uh, so what was the point? The point was that, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the local physics, so the physics we know of um, in special relativity carries over uh, to this Riemannian manifold, um, to this uh, Lorentzian manifold in terms of the local inertial coordinates. So physical laws, laws, uh, well, maybe first should be written in a manifestly coordinate invariant way, should be written. Is there a question or uh, I got a, some message from some strange sounds from the computer, no? No question? Good. Uh, can be uh, uh, written uh, in a manifestly coordinate independent form. So I'm going to switch to lowercase, otherwise it's going to take forever before I end the sentence. 
coordinate invariant form and this is the principle of um, coordinate invariant. So I'm not going to write this, but this is what it is, the principle of coordinate invariant. And good, so that's the first thing. But then if you go uh, uh, to these uh, local inertial coordinates, so in LIC, uh, they take the same form as in Minkowski spacetime. And this implies that a free fall is equal geodesics. So these two points, so let's see if I call this A and B, and implies A and B. Free fall corresponds to geodesics. A finely parametrized geodesics. Uh, Right, because, uh, uh, well, in um, lo local inertial coordinates, uh, Minkowskian physics means straight lines, and straight lines means, uh, is the same as geodesics. That's the co coordinate invariant form of writing it, so um, free fall corresponds to geodesics. Let me remind you the equation, d2 x mu, over ds square is uh, plus the Christoffels and this is supposed to be zero, okay? So uh, when we uh, decided to do this, uh, so the question is uh, what about gravitational forces? Where are the gravitational forces? And this is uh, what the section is about, right? So I want to explain to you uh, where the gravitational forces uh, sit uh, in such a framework. So framework Lorentzian manifold, uh, free fall is geodesics. What happened with the gravitational field? Of course, the answer will be, well, the gravitational field sits in G, and it has to do with uh, something called tidal forces. Uh, namely, if you just take uh, two nearby geodesics, well, they will be moving with respect to each other. Uh, and this motion is governed by something called the Jacobi equation or the geodesic deviation equation. Um, and this is what we're going to derive now. But before we do this derivation, and let me remind you that you are uh, most welcome to ask questions and interrupt, because if you don't ask, I don't know what are the things that you don't understand. So, uh, before we do the calculation of these famous tidal forces and the 
Jacobi deviation equation or the geodesic deviation equation. Uh, yeah, so the answer is, uh, so, uh, let me just write all these names because they are important. So uh, Jacobi equation, which is the same as uh, a geodesic deviation equation. <laughs> And the idea is that if you have one geodesic on your manifold and a new by one, then if you're sitting on this geodesic, you see the other one accelerating with respect to you. Right? So suppose time goes, well, let the time go up as it should. Uh, and so you have two geodesics here and you move along these geodesics and you sit on this geodesic, you look at the other one, well, the distance from where you sit to the next one will be changing because, well, maybe it won't, maybe it will. If you are in Minkowski space-time, it actually, uh, uh, what would we see, right? So in Minkowski space-time geodesic are straight lines, so if you have two which start parallel, then they will remain parallel and the distance between them will not change. If you have two geodesics which start, this noise will drive me crazy. I hope you don't hear it as much as I do. Uh, so if you have two which don't start parallel, so still straight lines, right? Then you will see the one moving with respect to another, of course, but with constant velocity, so no acceleration. So in Minkowski space-time, two new by geodesics, distance either constant or grows linearly, and uh, acceleration, relative acceleration is zero. Whether you're sitting on this one and you're looking at uh, the, the one to my, is it to my right or to my left now? <laughs> A tough problem, but I think it is to my right or left. Right? Well, anyway, <laughs> if you look at this one, right? Or if you're sitting at the, the one which is nearer to the board of the blackboard and uh, you're looking at this one, then of course the distance will also be changing and also will be changing linearly, right? Okay, so acceleration, if you think about the second derivative of the distance or the first derivative of the velocity, will be zero. Now, if you are in a curved space-time, of course, the geodesics don't look like that. They look whatever, whatever they're supposed to look. So in my picture, they're just actually getting closer together. And this uh, separation between the geodesics, as seen from any one of them, will be changing in time and might accelerate. Right? And so this acceleration is what we understand as uh, a tidal force, uh, and, uh, and is governed by the Jacobi equation or the geodesic deviation equation, which we're going to derive. And to understand why it's called tidal, uh, well, we're going to look at uh, a system which consists of the Earth and the Moon. And, uh, and the oceans, or, well, the oceans or whatever the seats. On the surface of, of the Earth, right? So we have the moon here. Uh, so the moon, there's this little guy uh, playing football out there. And here we have the Earth. So uh, you have uh, two continents and, and something like that. So that's a, uh, well, that's supposed to be North America and <laughs> South, South uh, America. And well, there are oceans here, right? So there's a, an ocean uh, somewhere, a, a lot of ocean, in fact. And uh, well, the moon uh, exerts a gravitational force on the Earth, 
so uh, so there will be a force which attracts uh, those points uh, on the surface of the moon in this way. I am going to, to write it uh, with a very big arrow. There's a force which attracts uh, those points uh, here uh, to the moon, but this force is smaller because it's further away, so I need to just draw, draw it with a slightly smaller arrow. And there is an overall force, if you just add all the forces uh, the way they act on Earth, uh, which acts on the center, which will therefore be, uh, well, certainly smaller than this one, and, uh, but louder than this one, so something intermediate here. Right? So this is how uh, uh, the gravitational force of the moon acts on, uh, on Earth. And now let's think we put uh, the Earth in a very big Einstein elevator. That's a really good one, right? So, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, well, how are we going to make, uh, we want to make this elevator accelerate so that the center of the Earth doesn't move. So, uh, so uh, we choose the uh, acceleration at the center of the Earth and uh, we forget that there is a moon, so there's no moon anymore here. But, and the whole system is accelerating so that the, Earth, the center of the Earth is not moving. But then, of course, the, uh, this means that the acceleration uh, that we used here, well, is going to be, so let me just use a different color. I think there's not that easy to have different colors on this blackboard, but, or uh, if I call this blackboard. So this is the central acceleration. So, uh, of course, the whole object is moving with the central acceleration, so it's going to this point is going to move with the same acceleration uh, as this one, and this point is also going to move with this same acceleration than this one, but this means that there will be uh, remaining forces uh, which act on, uh, on, this on these points here, right? So there is a, a deficit force um, here. Uh, so these points actually, even though they're not moving in my Einstein accelerator, feel an extra force in this direction. And uh, the ones which are sitting here also feel an extra force, but in the opposite direction, right? Because here I need to add a little, well, those feel a little more and those feel a little less. So the bottom line in my, accel in my Einstein accelerator for the Earth is a, round thing, which feels uh, extra forces, which doesn't move, but there are some extra forces acting here in this direction, and there are some extra forces acting here in this direction, right? So I hope I have the, uh, uh, the uh, directions right, so please correct me if not. Uh, well, I'm a mathematician at heart, not a physicist, so I might have it completely wrong. But remember also that this actually is bigger than this one, right? Because uh, this force was louder than this one, so, so, so this one is, is louder. Okay. So now, and so these are the tidal forces, and this is what makes uh, the tides in our sea. Because now we have to remember that Earth is rotating, right? So the center may be in our giant Einstein elevator is not moving, but the center is rotating. So the ocean at this point, when it comes here, will feel an extra force which is louder than when it was here. Right? And this is what causes tides, tides on Earth, because the ocean periodically feels different forces uh, from the moon. Uh, whether well, seen like that, it also feels different forces. Uh, here, it also feels different forces. Here, uh, this thing is obvious and have nothing to do with the uh, fact that you can switch off gravitation by going to a 
uh, accelerated system. Here, you switched off gravitation at the center of Earth by going through an uh, to a, um, accelerated system, but these points still feel some forces relative to this point. And these are the tidal forces, and that's the, uh, that's the motivation, uh, or that's the explanation of the name. Um, good, so let me just pass now to the formalism to describe all that. So our aim now is to write a formula for the relative acceleration of nearby geodesics. derive a formula for the relative, and this is important, right? So now uh, you're sitting on one geodesic, you want to see what the other does, acceleration. And then acceleration means force, uh, acceleration between geodesics. Good. So now the setup is the following. So we have a family of geodesics. Family of geodesics parametrized by lambda. So some parameter that we call lambda. In other words, we have a map which takes S and lambda, and this is in our manifold. Right, so this is the parameter which parameterizes the geodesics, and at fixed lambda, Uh, S gamma mu of S lambda is a geodesic. Is a and in fact, and a finely parametrized because that's uh, uh, that this equation here, which maybe I should have called one, is the equation for a, an a finely parametrized geodesic. A finely parametrized. So it's not only a geodesic, but it's a geodesic with a good parameter. And uh, when I say geodesic, normally I mean a finely parametrized. So, uh, but let me just write it explicitly here. So in other words, uh, D2 well, I'm not sure whether I should write a partial derivative uh, or a... Uh, well, in this case, I should write a partial derivative, right? Because this is um, um, depends upon two, two parameters. So... Uh, so... D2 gamma mu over E S square, right? So this is the x's or the gammas here. And uh, I made a mistake not to remove the water here. So this thing is actually decaying. Uh, ugly. Good. So d2 gamma mu over ds square plus gamma mu alpha beta d gamma alpha over ds d gamma beta over ds is zero. Right, and let me just call this uh, gamma dot, right? So this is gamma dot beta. 
means derivative with respect to s in this case it's a partial derivative but we have this uh, equation satisfied by this geodesic and now uh, we want to measure in some sense how uh, some one geodesic moves with respect to other to the remaining ones so we introduce something called the geodesic deviation vector the name for it is z historically so it's going to be z uh, i'm not trying to be original here it's hard to be original in this part of the lecture anyway since this is in every textbook but uh, what uh, some uh, physics textbook don't use is the name Jacobi equation. So Jacobi equation, you will not find it in uh, many physics textbook and uh, geodesic deviation equation you will not find it in many mathematics textbooks but these are the same things so uh, right so so we have this uh, uh, yes let's, so let's see we're, we're sitting at some geodesic uh, uh, so g s with a parameter lambda zero uh, well and we can uh, see what happens uh, on a new by one so we just make a Taylor expansion right so we just uh, this is the one at which we are sitting and a new by one will be given by this equation plus a, a partial derivative with respect to lambda at s and lambda naught times uh, uh, lambda minus lambda naught and there'll be error terms or order lambda naught square. Right? So we can just make a Taylor expansion and to lowest order in this parameter, in the difference of the parameters, uh, everything happens here. And this vector field is this famous uh, geodesic deviation equation vector so in other words z mu is uh, d gamma mu over d lambda and of course it depends upon both parameters and I'm not going to write it down here uh, good uh, so uh, I'm going to note an equation which I'm going to use before if I make a partial derivative of mu with respect to S, then this is d2 gamma mu over d lambda ds and this is the same as if I change the order of derivations well I already changed it here so let me so this is d over ds And z mu is d over d lambda, right? Okay. But I can change the order here because by, um, as, as a Mr. Schwartz who told me that I can do this. And therefore, this is the same as d over d lambda of uh, gamma dot. Right? So uh, this is an equation which we're going to need. Uh, talking about equations, I was reviewing the uh, notes from uh, the last lecture and uh, there was a stupid uh, sign mistake in one of my calculations when I was doing the divergence identity. So this is a parenthesis, but let me just mention this now. Uh, so... Uh, the divergence identity for the Ricci tensor is uh, d mu 
r mu alpha minus r half delta mu alpha. Why did I write alpha here? This is terrible. r half delta mu alpha is 0. And uh, if you look at the calculations of the proof last time, Everything was correct, except that at some pla place I just uh, changed the sign like an idiot. Uh, so uh, there was a pl plus sign in the proof, which was an obvious mistake. Nobody protested. I didn't protest. So the proof was apparently with a plus sign. But if you look at the proof, there's one place where I just uh, wrote the sign wrong. Of course, the, the right formula is this one. So please, uh, maybe you can, after this lecture, have a look at uh, the notes uh, that you too can correct this. I already corrected this in the notes which are online. So uh, I apologize for this. I, I do things like that uh, a lot, unfortunately. In any case, coming back to this uh, uh, equation 3, uh, if I take the derivative of z with respect to s. So, uh, so we have uh, this geodesic here, and gamma dot is the derivative in this direction, and z is actually going, looking at how nearby geodesics look like to uh, to leading order. So this is z, this is gamma dot, so this is the derivation in this direction. So if I differentiate that with respect to this parameter, it's the same as if I differentiate gamma dot with respect to this parameter. That's what this equation says. Good. Well, I wish this uh, magical blackboard was 10 times larger so that I would keep this equation, but uh, good. Well, I mean, the geodesic equation, you, I hope that by now you, you're familiar with it and you'll be able to remember that. So now we want to write an equation uh, for this vector z. Uh, and we want to write not just any stupid equation, but a nice looking covariant one. So, the calculation I'm going to do is pretty trivial. I'm just going to essentially use this equation, differentiate this equation two times. So, see, z measures the separation between the geodesics. So the first derivative of z measures the velocity of how fast the geodesics move away from each other, and the acceleration will be the second derivative. So I want to calculate the second derivative of z and uh, using the geodesic equation, and that's pretty straightforward because you just take the geodesic equation and you differentiate it twice and you're going to get it. But the point is that I want a nice formula for this. And to get nice in particular means coordinate independent. And so uh, to get a coordinate independent formula, uh, we set up, uh, so, so right. So again, so now uh, aim is to get a nice formula uh, for the second derivatives. And nice means that this should be covariant. And covariant, uh, this is not covariant, right? Because these are kind of, uh, well, oh, actually, this should be partials, in fact. So because there are two uh, parameters involved. Uh, and of course, uh, Derivatives of a vector, whether partials or full derivatives, do not have nice geometric properties. So uh, the trick is to introduce a covariant derivative along a curve. 
it's a nice means covariant and for this introduce a covariant derivative along a curve well in other words if you have a curve s gamma mu of s and here I just forget that there is a second uh, parameter I could just have as many parameters as I want here uh, and I have, have a vector field uh, so this should be a vector field say z uh, say w defined along this curve right so we have uh, any curve and we have some vector field who knows how it looks like right so this is v w mu of s right so in other words w mu of s is an element of the tangent space of the manifold at gamma of s and uh, I don't even need to write an index here just uh, w is a vector so I don't need indices an index means that it's a so this is uh, the formal way of writing this. Uh, then we set a d w mu over ds. Well, it's going to be the derivative with respect to s. And now we want this to be a vector field. What do we do? Well, we, we add a Christoffel part, right? So that we know that this is something which we need to add. Well, a Christoffel part, so uh, obviously, well, a Christoffel has two indices. Um, this is, uh, uh, so, so this Christoffel thing should be contracted with W alpha, obviously. And the direction of differentiation is uh, this uh, direction along the curve. And so along the curve means you uh, add a tangent here. So this is the formula for the so this is a definition right so an exercise you can check that this defines a, a, a again a, a vector field right exercise uh, in other words this transforms as a as a vector under change of coordinates dw mu over ds and this is a French exercise and make a, an English exercise you know I, I, I am, I'm never going to to, to learn this uh, S here uh, so uh, so the rest of my life I'll have to correct it if I think about it right so it transforms as a vector under coordinate changes and uh, of course if you just took this part uh, dw mu the partial well the, the derivative with respect to the parameter it does not you need this correction under changes of chords good so we have this nice uh, operation now uh, of course, we have, uh, this is true for the curves where you follow uh, the parameter S, but you also have a similar um, formula when you follow the, And this is, of course, not the diverge identity, but the divergence identity. Now this is going to just vanish, right? So this was the divergence identity. Okay. So I managed to correct something and put an error in the correction. Yeah. Good job. Great work. Uh, okay. Um, 
well, maybe not such a terrible mistake, but still annoying. Okay, so uh, where were we? Um, good, so we have our de derivative. Uh, uh, we also have, in our case, we have uh, uh, this family gamma mu of S lambda. So for each lambda fixed, we have curves and uh, derivative along these curves. But if we fix S and more lambda, we also have a derivative like that. and uh, then there's an obvious um, formula for this, right? So again, just mimic this, but we just have to differentiate with respect to a different parameter. So dm uh, over d lambda, it's going to be d w mu over d lambda. Well, maybe now this should be partials, not full derivatives. So maybe I should... Uh, put systematically partials here and systematically partials here, but I, I hope you're going to allow me the flexibility to not to worry about this. Uh, gamma mu alpha beta, and then again the vector alpha, but now we are differentiating with respect to the curves which are uh, d gamma mu over d lambda, uh, right, so the curves are tangent at s fixed lambda varies. So this direction of differentiation here is the direction of tangent to the curves in respect to lambda, and this is our z vector here. So this would be the formula in the other direction, and as another exercise, uh, I think this one is in the Yes, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, this is true, but then uh, this should be beta, so let me just change this to beta or everywhere to make it clearer. Well, you know, in some, at some stage in my lectures, I decided to make an experiment and to count how many mistakes I make of this kind during a lecture. And it was so embarrassing that I stopped. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so we could just for fun. Uh, so how many did I do today? Only two? Let's say I did two. Okay, let me just start a counter here. So, two typos. Uh, okay, so, so this is a z beta, right? So we have this formula for the covariant derivative and the exercise. Uh, well, I'm not counting the c out there, which I corrected. So, let me count it as a half error. Uh, the exercise, what happens if you commute derivative? So, if you just take d over... Uh, d lambda, d over ds, uh, and I should write a small d, because I've been writing a small d here. You could write a big one if you want to. Right? If you change the order of derivatives, what will you get? Well, I think on one hand it's obvious what you're going to get because uh, this is just the commutator of covariant derivatives, right? So, so 
uh, if you make a commutator of covariant derivatives, then you're going to get the Riemann tensor. But uh, it uh, makes sense for you to make this exercise because it's going to be a good check if you uh, remember how one proves this. Right? So this is r mu alpha beta gamma and w alpha because we always have a term like that. Now this index here is the derivative in this direction. And this direction is uh, the tangent to, uh, to the lambda curves. So this should be a zeta um, direction. And d over ds is the direction tangent to the geodesics. Uh, so this should be in the direction tangent to So this is the formula uh, that you should get out of this. And uh, now we're ready to uh, uh, derive uh, the Jacobi equation. And the equation is uh, the following second derivative of z. So second, now covariant derivative. And that was the whole point of the exercise, was to get a nice covariant formula. So the second derivative of z is, uh, well, Riemann tensor. Right? Riemann tensor. And now uh, the question is, what can it be, right? So it has three indices. One should be left. And uh, there are... Um, so, so this one we already have. This is a covariant derivative of z, so there should be some z here. And there are two derivatives tangent to the geodesics, so there should be two gamma dot. And now the question is, uh, what is the right, uh, what are the right indices? So I always, I never remember this equation, or I can only remember it up to sign. So let me tell you how. Uh, just losing things all the time. So, um, so how to remember it up to sign, right? So, and then we'll have to check the sign uh, at the end of the calculation. But, uh, well, you have two gammas here. And the gammas, uh, why do you have two gamma dots? Because they'll have two derivatives tangent to the geodesic. So uh, you have two gamma dots, and if you contracted them with these indices, this would be zero, because the Riemann tensor is anti-symmetric when you change this. And if you had two indices beta gamma here, that would be symmetric, that would be zero. Obviously, not what we want. In other words, one of the indices of the gamma dots must be an alpha. An alpha. Well, and the other one has to be a beta or a gamma. Well, it doesn't matter up to sign, right? So, of course, the sign is important. But up to sign, uh, I can put uh, the last one, say, here. So uh, alpha and gamma here. And then the only one here is beta. And then uh, the only option is here at this stage is as plus or minus, right? And I think that the sign is correct as is, but, uh, well, we'll find out. So uh, we have to do the calculation, and the calculation is easy. Uh, so this is our equation 5, by the way. Uh, so I wish I had all the equations from before, but uh, uh, I don't have uh, enough room to keep them as I go. So um, isn't the one dot already equation five? 
Uh, thank you. So this is six. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, one half, okay. Let's be... <laughs> uh, let's increase it only by one half. It's not such a big mistake. Thank you, Eva. Um, So, uh, good. So, how do we calculate this? Well, we're going to use uh, this equation uh, for w mu is equal gamma dot. Um, w mu is equal gamma dot mu. in equation 6. And uh, first, uh, we're going to use d over ds uh, then uh, w mu is in this case d over ds gamma dot mu. Well, if I look at the definition of d over ds, I get d2 gamma mu over ds square plus gamma mu alpha beta, and then once the vector gamma, and once the tangent to the curve, and this is zero by the geodesic equation, right? Geodesic equation. Good. So, uh, so in other words, d over ds already is going to kill this term, so this one will be gone. And now, uh, so this is, uh, so this, this derivative is, is gone. And now if I look at d over d lambda over uh, d lambda, then this is, uh, and in our case, w is gamma dot. So this is d gamma dot mu over lambda, which is uh, good. Well, let's write it, right? So this is uh, d2, d over d lambda, uh, d gamma mu over ds, uh, plus the covariant part, one with gamma dot, because I'm differentiating gamma dot, and because I'm differentiating with respect to Lambda, I had this z beta vector field, right? So z beta was uh, d gamma beta over d lambda. Uh, but this one is the same as d over ds, uh, d gamma mu over d lambda. Now I should have written partial derivatives uh, rather than um, full ones, but uh, I hope you understand what I'm doing. And this is uh, our vector z. So this is the same as uh, d z mu over d s plus this gamma business uh, gamma dot alpha, so uh, gamma dot alpha and z beta. And if you use the symmetry of the gammas, then this is the same as d z mu over ds. Okay, so in other words, d w mu over d lambda is dz mu over ds. 
And now I just put this in my equation 5. So this term was 0. This is by 7, and this is by 8. So this by 7 is 0. And this one, d over lambda d mu is dz mu over ds. I get second derivatives of z, exactly what I wanted, right? I get second derivatives of z with the wrong sign here. Good. The wrong sign compared to what I wrote here. But then, so in other words, if I put this all this into 5, uh, now it's going to be tricky because I don't want to erase 5. I don't want to erase my Jacobi equation. This is called the Jacobi equation or the geodesic deviation equation. This is the main equation of this section. Right? So it's telling you the acceleration because it's second derivatives of the vector which connects nearby geodesics. And this is measured by a Riemann tensor. So the Riemann tensor, the curvature tensor of space-time, measures how neighboring geodesics deviate from each other. And that's maybe one understanding of what the Riemann tensor is. And this is one understanding of what, gra what are the gravitational forces in general relativity, right? Gravitational accelerations between freely falling bodies are measured by the Riemann tensor. Good, but let's finish this calculation here. Uh, so, um, let's see if I can manage to make it acceptable. very strange, but maybe it will work. So, um, right, so, so into 5, the first thing vanishes, the second gives me minus d2 z mu over ds square is equal r mu alpha beta gamma, w was gamma dot, z beta, and so I got the sign wrong. Right, so here we put gamma dot. This goes away. This I got correct, I hope, because this was d over d lambda. So this is direction z. This is direction tangent to the geodesics, d over ds. So that's the usual formula for, OK? So, uh, so the sign is, was wrong here. So, right, so I had to have a minus, which, OK. So the sine was minus. Half mistake? OK, because I should have remembered this one. Let me check in my note, because I somehow, my feeling is that we should have, hmm. No, that's correct. OK. Uh -huh. That's the correct formula. So this is uh, the Jacobi equation. Good. So uh, tidal forces or gravitational forces arise in general relativity through the Riemann tensor. Uh, 
that's a good exercise and it might be in your problem sheets that uh, uh, this equation would reproduce the right formula for the uh, movement of tides on Earth um, in the Newtonian limit. That's something we might do uh, at some stage when we will have seen what the Newtonian limit of general relativity is. Uh, good. So, um, how are we doing this time? 11.50 and we started at... So, we still have about half an hour, right? Um, yeah, good. So, uh, the question now arises, uh, what kind of equations do I want to write for uh, general relativity with matter fields? We already told you what are the right equations last time without really saying much more about it. I'm going to return to this, but uh, The question really is how to couple matter with the curvature tensor. And before we do this, I'm going to get a, a little trip uh, on, and that probably uh, section 3.3, uh, is it? Yeah, I think it is. Eva? 3? Yes, it is. Actually. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good. And so, uh, dust in GR. And the reason why I'm doing this uh, is to show you that this geodesic equation uh, is actually uh, encoded in uh, the energy momentum tensor for dust in general relativity. I show that uh, dust in GR follows geodesics. So, I've told you uh, we're going to take it as an axiom that freely falling non-interacting bodies follow geodesics. Uh, well, in fact, this is already built in the theory and uh, this can be seen as follows. So first of all, uh, a reminder from SR, something that we did. Um, so SR being special relativity. So let me just write it in full, but this is SR. Uh, dust can be described by an energy momentum tensor, which is rho u mu u nu, uh, where rho, where u is a vector satisfying well of unit length, and this is the four velocity vector. for velocity of dust. And rho is the rest density, rest mass density, which is the same as rest energy density, of course, because C is one, as well known in the universe, C is one. Um, Good. So this is the energy momentum tensor of, uh, of dust. And uh, so what are we going to uh, do in general relativity, in special relativity? That's what we did. And this tensor, by the way, uh, satisfies the conservation equation, uh, d mu, t mu nu equals zero. 
that's what uh, conservation of matter is, right? So, or conservation of energy in special relativity is the same as, as this equation. So, uh, we're going to use our principle how to go from special relativity to general relativity. Well, we go to local inertial coordinates, and in local inertial mm -hmm. coordinates, this should be the energy momentum tensor of dust. This should be the four velocity of dust. And now in local inertial coordinate, eta is the same as g, so we can just put g here. And uh, rho is the mass density, and there's nothing more to say, right? So uh, we're going to say in gr, uh, t mu nu remains like that. This becomes g of u, u is minus 1. And of course, in local inertial coordinate, this is the same as the, uh, because the Christoffels vanish, I can replace uh, at the center of the of local inertial coordinates, the Christoffels vanish. So I can, I think if I'm doing everything wrong. It's erasing. So I can replace the uh, the partial derivative here by a covariant one. Good. So, in GR, uh, well, t mu nu is still rho u mu nu. Rho is still the rest mass density. Uh, then the length of this tangent vector should be minus 1. And the covariant derivative should be 0. So uh, let me call this equation one, equation two, and equation three. So now the claim is uh, the integral curves curves of the vector field. U. Uh, what does this mean? I.e., well, we just take a solution of the equations dx mu over ds is equal u mu, right? Solutions of R time like. Well, time-like is clear because this is what time-like means. Tangent vector negative lengths are finely parameterized. So I'm just essentially rewriting this thing here. Parameterized. See, there is a, the reason why I'm smiling is because uh, there's a trick uh, to make me look at the camera rather than at the screen. The screen is here, but the camera is slightly higher. And of course, if you want to have the impression that I want to connect with you, which I certainly do, but if you were in the lecture front in front of me, I, in the lecture hall in front of me, I would just be looking directly in your eyes. So see the Eva, when I'm looking at you now, I'm looking directly in your eyes, but you don't see it because I'm looking at your eyes on the screen. And now you think that I'm probably looking at your eyes, but I'm not. I'm just looking above. Okay. That's how it works. But uh, so um, 
Uh, so there's a trick to force me to look there. It's a little teddy bear with a big smile and uh, a moon nose shoots and uh, big glasses. So when I look at it, I just can't help but to smile. And also it forces me to, to look there. So when I look at you, I smile. Uh, and so uh, if you think, well, this guy is an idiot, he smiles once in a while like, like an idiot, right? So <laughs> uh, I might very well be an idiot, that's another thing, but uh, at least uh, you have a rational uh, explanation for why uh, once in a while I, I smile because I look at this cute teddy bear <laughs> sitting in front uh, or near the camera. Good. So uh, let's see. So we want to, uh, to, to prove this, right? So, uh, so you have this vector uh, field u uh, all over the place, right? So uh, u looks like that. And uh, so this is your vector u mu. And you look at the integral curves. It means that you uh, take a curve so that uh, uh, it tangent to this curve is this vector u everywhere, right? So these are the tangent the integral curves of the vector field, right, and, and so forth. And these integral curves are our geodesics. By the way, uh, this is this um, embarrassing question which I like to ask. How do you know that solutions of this equation exist? There's a theorem about this. So while I'm erasing the blackboard, maybe somebody can try to remember what's the name of the theorem which comes with this equation. Yeah, so, so the question is, do there, how do I know that integral curves of a vector field exist, or maybe a, a better question would be uh, sorry I vanished, I had to pick up another cloth. Uh, under what conditions do we know that this equation has a solution. You know, right now I'm actually in the cellars of the Mathematical Institute, right? So just uh, near the Danube, uh, not at Postman Gasse, but this contraption here is, is the, at the Mathematical Institute. And um, So, of course, I have a good excuse to ask you mathematical questions, right? So, uh, so, anybody can tell me? When do we know that solution? Just pick a Lindelof if u mu is c1. Say it again. Pick a Lindelof. Uh, the method to prove or something like that may be okay. But the, uh, so, so, let's see. So, I don't know a, a theorem so that... Because this is an existence theorem for ordinary differential equations, right? So that's what you need here. And so P. Lindelof. Maybe you know something that I don't know. <laughs> Maybe this is like the binding background that exists there, but there's something to explain more specific here. That's got a better name or something. <laughs> Anybody, somebody else has a, has a suggestion for a different name here in this context? Maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe you know. Maybe this is uh, some theorem which, which I don't know. I know the Picard iteration method, which certainly can be used to prove the theorem. So maybe in some textbook they use this name for this. That's that's yeah, well. Okay, but uh, some other names which come up in this context. So um, there is a nice theorem, which is called Cauchy-Lipschitz theorem, which you should ha must have heard in Analysis 3 uh, or, or some such lecture uh, that uh, if, um, well, if u is differentiable 
or more generally, if it satisfies a Lipschitz condition, and I'm not going to write what a Lipschitz condition is uh, right now, but you might, if you're, in, if you're curious and you've forgotten, you can just try to uh, remember uh, or look up what it was. So if uh, this vector field at the right-hand side here satisfies a Lipschitz condition, then there exists a unique solution of this equation. Right? So, so uh, you give me a differentiable field, a differentiable field certainly satisfies the Lipschitz condition, then this uh, equation will have solutions. So we'll have these integral curves, and they're supposed to be geodesics. And let's uh, prove this. Right? So, so prove is just uh, uh, use the divergence identity. Uh, use d mu uh, t mu nu equals zero, and uh, maybe I'm going to write it like that because the metric is covariantly constant. So uh, whether I write it with an index down or with an index up doesn't matter. So this equation, if I put the uh, form of um, of the energy momentum tensor, I'm going to get that. Now uh, I'm going to use the chain rule, so the covariant derivative of a product, but I'm going to split it into two parts like that. Right? So rather than splitting it three parts, which I could, but then the calculation is slightly longer. Uh, uh, I'm going to get uh, uh, this equation where I split in two. Okay. So let's call this equation uh, three. No, one, two, three, so that's equation four. Uh, so, uh, so we now just take 4 and multiply by u nu. Uh, you're going to get d mu rho u mu u nu u nu plus rho u mu d mu u nu u nu equals 0. Now, the claim is, well, there's something which is easy here. This is... Uh, u nu u nu is just uh, say uh, if we think of this index as being lowered with the metric so this is g nu alpha u nu u alpha and this is the same as the length of u and this is minus one so this one is minus one and my claim is that uh, this thing here is zero uh, what did I do with the indices here? Uh, this index should be down, right? Well, I've noticed it myself, so this counts like half a mistake, not a full one. Well, no, it's still a full mistake. Come on. It's an annoying interruption of the pedagogical process. <laughs> so. Good. Uh, so, so now the claim is that this is zero. So if I call this star, star is zero. And you probably don't see claim. So Okay, so you might I have to erase here. Uh, so you can meanwhile try to think, how is it possible that this is zero? The answer is it comes from the fact that the length is minus one, right? From the same reason that this is minus one, it's going to follow that uh, this is zero.
so let's see. So uh, we want to prove that this thing is zero. So uh, let's differentiate. Uh, uh, so, so let me just do the cute proof, right? So the cute proof is the, the good as follows. Uh, uh, if I take the covariant derivative of the scalar product of u u, then this is uh, uh, first. Well, this is a triple product, right? So, so I'm going to do the proof with indices in detail again. But this is a triple product, so if you just use Leibniz rule, they have d mu of g uh, of u u plus uh, g of d mu u u plus g of u d mu u. Now the metric is covariantly constant, so this is zero. And g is symmetric, so this is twice. Uh, so these things are equal. So this is, uh, you can change the order in the metric and I get the same. So it's g u d mu u, which is, now if I write it in detail, u sigma d mu u sigma. And is this already what we want? Uh, yeah, I can just change the lower and uh, uh, Okay, so this is exactly the same thing, right? So this is star. Good, this is the cute proof, and now uh, I, I don't want to be such a smart ass, uh, so let's do it uh, slow proof. Uh, we just calculate d mu. Well, this product is just g alpha beta u alpha u beta. Now, so this is what I told you. I'm going to use the uh, Leibniz rule, and because the metric is covariantly constant, I'm not going to write this term here. So I'm immediately going to put the derivative. On. On the use. And so, yeah, so now if I want to, to write it, uh, uh, let's see, so this I can write as g beta, right? You uh, lower the index on, on u, so this is uh, the same as u, u, u beta. Uh, here I can lower the index on, on u, and this is the same as uh, then u alpha. Then this is then u alpha d mu u alpha plus u beta d mu u beta. And now this index, whether I call it beta or alpha, doesn't matter. So let me call this alpha, then call this one alpha. And it's clear that this is twice the same, right? So it's 2 u alpha d mu. U alpha. Now, and this is of course zero because this is minus one. So this is zero. And uh, yeah, I, I should probably have said the same in my cute proof. That's again, that's probably a, a, a very bad mistake not saying it right before. This is minus one. So the derivative is zero. Right? Good. So, uh, okay. So, but the, the, the uh, point of this was to show that this term is zero. And so if I go back to this equation, uh, which we should call five. So now five, uh, this term is zero. This one is, is minus one. So five gives me a something called conservation of matter or something like that, divergence of rho u mu equals zero. Um, yeah, so I'm going to run out of place again. Well, so let me just get rid of the proofs. 
I hope it's okay now to, to erase everyone. Please protest if you haven't finished copying. There will be no uh, handwritten notes from me because it's all on the screen, but hopefully there'll be a video if we haven't. Done something wrong. Good. So five now gives me uh, that this divergence is zero. And uh, that's why I just split it into two parts rather than three. But now if you go back to four, into four, then this is zero. And I get rho u mu d mu u nu equals zero. And so in the region where rho is not zero, and that's, uh, of course, the only interesting region, because uh, who cares what this field is where there is no matter. So where rho is non zero, we get this uh, equation here. And uh, the claim is that this is, uh, so that would be equation uh, four, five, or six, and claim this is the geodesic equation. As uh, the geodesic equation for the integral for the flow. For, so these uh, integral curves are called the flow of this vector field for the flow of u. And let's write it down in detail. Uh, so u mu is dx mu over ds. And we have d mu uh, u nu plus gamma nu mu uh, beta u beta equals 0. Uh, then if I calculate d u of x of s over ds, then this is the same as the partial derivative of nu with respect to coordinates times the derivative of mu with respect to s. And then this is therefore this term here. And uh, here I can just replace this by dxb over ds. And uh, if I call this 7 and 8, so 7 and 8 give me the first term is d, uh, well, second derivative of, since u is the first derivative of x, then this is the second derivative of x plus gamma nu mu beta dx mu over ds dx beta over ds equals 0. Okay. So the conclusion of this is dust in general relativity. If I take what I know from special relativity transported to general relativity 
using local inertial coordinates, I get a system of equation which is telling me that the velocity field, if I take the velocity field of dust and I take the integral curves of this, of this field, so it's the curves along which particles move, then these curves satisfy the uh, geodesic equation, another half error for this new missing cell. Today we are one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, minus six for me today. Okay, I'll try to do better next time. Questions? If there are no questions, I'll see you uh, on Thursday. Thank you for coming and bye-bye. Thank you. See you then. Thank you. Bye-bye.